Welcome to my vintage love. I am so excited to bring you this video today. I've wanted to shoot this for a long time. This is a World War II beauty hacks video. So we are going to talk about all the things that women were using for cosmetics when they couldn't get their hands on the real thing. Because during World War II, there were many, many, many restrictions on what kind and how much of cosmetics could be made due to rationing, due to metal shortages, glycerin shortages, fat shortages, all those kind of things. So women had to get really creative and um, do some really fun stuff to, to make themselves look and feel beautiful and also you know, do their part for the war effort. Beauty is duty was a huge idea at the time. Uh, there was this notion that, you know, to be part of the war effort, you needed to keep your fences mended, you needed to keep yourself looking good. Uh, one of my favorite, favorite quotes that I saw a very long time ago was, if he loves you, he remembers you even prettier than you are, so keep your fences mended and make sure the face that he comes home to lives up to his dreams. So, I always laugh when I hear that that quote. I think it's very funny and kind of encapsulates what was expected of women at the time. And there was this this interesting dichotomy of keep yourself looking good, but don't overdo it because then you would be seen as you know taking too much time out of your day, you know, not focusing enough on the war effort, you know, just being overindulgent. So I think that's kind of this tension that existed back then. And I, I just, I think it's really interesting. I think it always is to a certain extent. Um, the war effort, as I mentioned, really clamped down on, on the creation of makeup, on the research and development of makeup. So there's a real austerity to this look. Um, this is the full look that I'm wearing right now. Uh, I actually think that there was not many women on the home front or in the military would have been wearing this much makeup actually at the time. I think most women probably would have stopped with a little powder and a little lipstick, maybe a little rouge. Um, but I did want to show you all of the options that I found during my research to that women would have used to kind of create a full face if they needed to. Um, so let's get to it. And I'm going to start out with um, a clean face. So we're going to start out with skincare. Women back then used basically cold cream to cleanse their face and might leave it on overnight. And then they also used something called vanishing cream, um, which would vanish into the skin. And this is a lovely version made by Besame Cosmetics. And you can also use it, so it's a moisturizer, but it also provides a really lovely base for um, and acts as a primer. So basically they weren't using a lot of foundation back then. That wasn't really something that was used on a daily basis like we do now. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and use a little tiny bit of vanishing cream. So what they would do is they would put vanishing cream all over their face and then top that with some powder as kind of a foundation. So you wouldn't get a lot of coverage necessarily, but it would kind of be like a lovely smooth powdered finish to your skin. This is meant to vanish into the skin, hence its name. I imagine that some women were using homemade recipes too for skincare. I didn't look into homemade recipes necessarily, but I'm sure they existed, all the beautiful gardens and people on farms and things like that. So I'm sure that that was definitely something that was happening at the time. And next I'm going to be powdering my skin. This is a T. Leclerc powder. Um, this is a metal tin, but something that you saw a lot of during World War II was metal packaging going into paper packaging because metal was very severely restricted and it was all meant to be used for the war effort and not for cosmetics. So that was something you saw. I always think of the Cody Airspun packaging, that beautiful, the beautiful cardboard packaging that we, so many of us saw on our grandmother's dressing tables. At least I know I saw on my grandmother's dressing table. So I'm just gonna go in here with a powder puff and some of this lovely powder. I'm just going to gently roll that, pat that into my skin. Again, you're not going to get, it's not like a foundation like we think of today, so you're not going to get a lot of coverage necessarily, but you are going to get a lovely, nice, smooth, powdered finish to the skin. And I have done two videos before this, one about, um, more day-to-day -day home front beauty and then another one about more glamorous Hollywood beauty. So if you'd like to know more about that, please watch those. Um, I think it's important to remember that, you know, we have this kind of idealized version of what 
everyday women were wearing back then, but it was it was probably quite minimal. Um, you see these pictures of women wearing, you know, not not a lot of makeup. So I think it's important to remember that. I think lipstick was kind of like the star of the show for the most part. They were not walking around, by and large, for the full for the for the most part with full faces of, of foundation and you know the full beat, as it were. That was more reserved for um, movie stars and folks on screen. Okay, so. A nicely powdered face. Always nice. Um, so next, and one of the more interesting things that I found out in my research was what they would use for mascara if they couldn't get their hands on it. Cake mascara did exist back then. Um, this is a Besame cake mascara. Cake mascara was invented in 1917. It looked something like this. Um, Maybelline made one, and you know it came with this kind of funny, like little itty bitty toothbrush looking thing. Absolutely, women would have used this back then if they could get their hands on it. Um, I love the story that I heard. They called it spit cake, and I once heard a story from someone about how in Europe, at least, when they knew the soldiers were coming, you could hear the girls run to their dressing tables and start spitting in their spit cakes to get their mascara on because they knew the soldiers were coming, so they wanted to make themselves very pretty. I think you're technically supposed to use water, but um, spit was definitely something that was used to activate this and get it ready to go. There's a few scenes from a few movies where you can see actresses you know, on screen spitting into it and putting it on, and it's, it's pretty awesome. Um, so this is a Besame one that is still made today. Um, but what they would use if they couldn't get their hands on mascara, cake mascara, is they would burn a cork. So they'd burn a cork and put Vaseline or some kind of petroleum jelly with it. This is Elizabeth Arden's eight hour cream that was it was invented in 1930, so they would have had something like this at the time. So I'm going to go ahead and burn this cork and use the ashes combined with petroleum jelly and put it on my lashes and we can kind of see what effect that creates. So we have a decent amount of ash from the cork here, and like ash does, it's very light, so it flies up all over the place. So if you are going to try this at home, um, just be aware of that. It gets pretty messy pretty quickly. Not the cleanest techniques, I guess. So got our little bit of ash, cork ash in there. Then I'm going to put a little bit of the Elizabeth Arden 8-hour cream, Vaseline, petroleum jelly, anything like that will work. So I'm just going to take a tiny, tiny bit of the Vaseline, the 8-hour cream, and mix it as carefully as I can with the ash, just to get, you know, a nice kind of black paste. Um, I am using a little tiny fan brush. I'm not quite sure they would have had that back then. Um, they, maybe they used a toothbrush, or maybe they had a brush from their spit cake, their cake mascara, um, or maybe they just used their finger. Um, but I'm taking a bit of a liberty, so I'm going to use um, use this. Um, you know, a bit of a learning curve, kind of combining ash and Vaseline. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Not something we do every day. Um, but you know, I have a nice little black paste going on here, so I'm going to go ahead and try that. So I'm just going in and, you know, applying this like I'd apply mascara with a fan brush. And it's actually working pretty well. So I don't know about the longevity of this necessarily, just because it is a, the base is a petroleum product. You probably would not be able to get a huge, long, you know, day-long, 12-hour wear out of this. Certainly not waterproof, but um, I think it's working really nicely. You can see the difference between this eye and this eye, so I think it's um, works surprisingly well. I'll go ahead and do the other eye. I have the mask, the mascara on both eyes. I think it turned out surprisingly well. Definitely a bit of a learning curve in terms of how much petroleum jelly do we need to mix with the ash. Um, it can get a little chunky, so I had to comb through them. But all in all, 
a really cool hack that would serve in a pinch. <laughs> to use this ash even more, we're gonna use a little bit in dry in my brows. So I'm gonna be using this angled brush. This is from Smith Cosmetics. And then I'm gonna be using the, what's left of the dry ash at the bottom of the bowl here. So I'm just gonna be dipping in my brush a little bit into that ash, tapping it off. Like I said, this is gonna fly everywhere, so <laughs> be careful. And then I'm gonna try and get just a little on the back of my hand. You can always, can always add more, so start soft. So I'm gonna start on the outer third and really, really, really gently work that through my brow, stroke by stroke. It gets really light. This is very soft, the, the ash, so you do have to be very careful with it. I started on the outer third, which is what I do all the time. I'm just gonna brush through this with a spoolie. I suspect if you had very, very light brows, you would have to be extra, extra, extra careful. Um, if you were blonde, <laughs> um, you'd have to be extra careful. But this is working quite well. It's just a matter of, of the softness of the, the application. I, I'm barely, barely touching my, my, my eyebrows because it's going on so easily. But you can see the difference in this brow versus this brow already. Um, and you know, doing it softly, it's, it's, creating, it's creating a nice brow. You just have to you know, have a soft hand at it. So I, I do think this works surprisingly well. Not bad for ash, for cork ash. Um, you can definitely see the difference. And I'm just gonna go ahead and do that as eyebrow. So I'm gonna leave the eyes there for now. We're gonna come back to them at the end and I'm gonna move on to the cheeks and lips. Rouge has been around for centuries. They definitely had that in the 40s and women absolutely would have used lipstick um, if they had it on their cheeks for rouge. We can still do that today. Um, but something that I read about that I thought was really cool was that women would use beets on their cheeks and their lips to create this like beautiful natural flush. And when I was, when I tried it, I really, really liked it. So I'm going to show you how to do that now. So we have our beet, big knife. So beautiful beet, maybe fresh from the garden if you had a farm or a garden back then. And I'm just going to go ahead and put it right on my, right on my cheek. And you can see immediately how kind of color dense that is. I'm just going to kind of tap that in. In there. It really does create this, you know, beautiful, lovely flush. You could certainly go f put it on your fingers and then put it on your cheek, but you know, we're just gonna go for it. It reminds me of the benefit Benetint in terms of you know how fast you need to blend it out and the color payoff and everything. So yeah, I think that's really pretty. I mean, I can absolutely imagine being on the home front you know, no other options, but beets, you know, why not? They've been using this to dye clothing for a long time and it stains the skin so beautifully. It's, it's really pretty. I like it a lot. I think that you'd probably get a nice long wear out of this because it is, you're staining the skin essentially. So it would probably, it would probably last a decent amount of time too, I think. And then I am going to put lipstick on after this, but I'm just going to go ahead and put a little bit on my lips too. It's, you know, it's not an ideal applicator, obviously. You could definitely go in and use your finger if you want a little more, a little more precision, but, you know, just creating a little bit of color, just that little stain, a little whisper of color is nice. You know, there's more color than there, there was before. So, this is beats on the cheeks and beats on the lips. Next up is lipstick. And lipstick was one of those things that was fully embraced um, by the government, by women. It was seen as a symbol of femininity. It was seen as a symbol of 
keeping keeping your fences mended, um, staying feminine, staying put together, even at the even if you were in the military, even if you were at a factory on the home front, um, it was one of those very symbolic things. Um, in the U.S. and Britain, um, makeup in general and lips and lipstick in particular was very much seen as part of your patriotic duty as a woman. Supposedly, tr Winston Churchill came up with the phrase "beauty as duty." He supposedly came up with with slogans such as "lipstick is your weapon and you are the rear soldiers." So I don't know how true that is, but I love that story. Um, I don't know if he was that involved with you know that whole part, but I do love that. And in the U.S., at the beginning of the war, they actually ceased production of cosmetics entirely. But within a few months, they realized how important it was for morale, and they brought it back within a certain production of cosmetics back to a certain degree, um, just because they realized the importance of it. In 1941, the U.S. government commissioned Elizabeth Arden to create a line of cosmetics specifically for female American soldiers, and included a nail polish, a blush, and a lipstick named Montezuma Red, which was very very famous and very popular, and then eventually it became, and she created another one called Victory Red, which is another, which is a shade of red by Besame. I don't know if they're exactly the same red. They really do a good job with their research, so I, I suspect that it was, um, and probably very similar to that red. Um, but you see all kinds of advertising campaigns from this time saying, beauty is your duty with all of these different all these different reds, all these different lipsticks geared towards making women feel feel that they were playing their part in, in the war effort by keeping themselves looking good. Um, so, of course, it was harder to get a hold of, so I read about one technique um, in a magazine back then about how, you know, how to use less lipstick to make whatever you have last longer. Um, and it was pretty simple. So you would, it would just involve powdering your lips, so I'm going to just put a little powder on the lips. And then Victory Red. You're supposed to put it on the top lip. And then press your lips together. And then use your little finger to spread it around and kind of create the lip line that you want to have. Nowadays, The brush would be easier, but this would have been certainly would have been one way to make the lipstick last a little bit longer. Finishing that up, and the last part would be to powder your lips again to make it last a long time, which is still a great thing to do nowadays if you really want to get a nice long wear out of your lipstick. So, So that would be one way to make your lipstick last longer on your lips and also in the tube. So that's a cute little trick. Um, another part of red lipstick and why it was so popular in allied countries was that supposedly Hitler hated makeup in general and red lipstick in particular. He thought makeup desecrated a woman's natural beauty. And so by wearing red lipstick, you could kind of, it was a silent protest slash F you to Hitler slash protest against the fascist regime. So I really, I really like that too. Um, so this is where I think most women on the home front in the military, probably this would have been a full face for them back then. And they probably would have stopped here, or maybe they just would have done their eyebrows, just would have done some powder and lipstick, most likely. And I do want to say that I'm seeing a little bit, the, the mascara that I used is transferring a little tiny bit. So like I was saying before, probably not a super long wearing situation, but or maybe don't wear it on the bottom. But anyways, little cleanup. Take care of that. Okay. I do want to show you one quick other thing. Uh, this is a way to get some a tiny bit of shadow on your eye. Um, this is actually a trick that I heard that Marlena Dietrich did back in the day. So it, it's been around a while, but it is kind of a fun something something different homespun DIY hack. So um, we are going to use a different kind of soot. <laughs> um, I'm going to burn the bottom of this saucer to get some soot, combine it again with a little bit of petroleum jelly, eight hour cream, and put it on my lids to create a, um, a bit of a bit of an eyeshadow look. Mm -hmm. 
So we have a little bit of soot here. I'm going to wait for it to cool down a little bit because it is really hot. I found that out last night when I was testing all of these methods. You don't actually need a lot. This is plenty. I did try this technique using the the ash from the cork mixed with Vaseline on my lid. And, I, and then I tried this technique with the soot from here mixed with Vaseline on my lid and the soot with Vaseline did work better and you didn't have the little chunks of ash. So if you were wondering, this is actually a little bit better for eyeshadow if you wanted to try it. Again, not a super long wearing situation, but it does look really pretty. So I'm gonna add a little teeny tiny bit of that eight hour cream. You do not need a lot, a little goes a long way. I'm just gonna do my this with my fingertip. So a little, little soot going so you can kind of see so I think it feels like a good amount I'm trying to keep it on the more subtle side the application feels good I think again it's one of those things it's because it's so DIY you you have to be careful and apply it slowly and kind of build up layers and figure out as you go what the ratio to soot versus Vaseline is that will work for you. Is this going to be long wearing? No, but it can give you that kind of a, a shade, a shadow of gray across your lid, a little more depth to the lid, you know, and if you didn't have any other options, then this would be great. So I'm going to go ahead and do that other eye. And like I said, this would probably be I don't think most women would have been using this trick on a day-to-day -day basis. This would have been a very special occasion kind of situation to, to do eyeshadow of any kind. Even if you had eyeshadow, it would have been more of a special occasion thing. Um, I, th I think most women would have stopped with powder and lipstick, maybe a little rouge. Um, but this is just to show you that there are options. So because of the of all of the war effort going on, all of the R&D, all of the cosmetics that were being made in the 30s, that stopped in the 40s, that stopped during World War II, and then, and then you see this austerity for beauty, but then in the 50s there was this huge boom, this huge rebirth in R&D and all of these things, so that's when you see the, the really fun colors happening the big bolder looks, the the you know slightly overdrawn lips, the, the the big eyebrows. So I think that's something that we when we put 40s and 50s together in terms of beauty, we kind of need to be careful about that because the 40s really. If you're talking about wartime 40s, it really was a much more austere look, and the 50s, the post-war late 40s, early 50s into the 50s was when makeup got much more exciting and much more colorful and much more interesting. So um, just to keep that in mind, so if you are doing like a true World War II reenacting or um, something like that, keep that in mind when you're doing that. They weren't doing a full a full face like they might have been doing post-war. So this is the full look for World War II beauty hacks. Um, it's been really fun. I really hope you learned something. I've been wanting to do this video for a really, really long time. So please subscribe below if you haven't already and follow us on Instagram at mybitchesloveblog for even more regular updates and we will see you at the next one. Bye.